I'm thankful for those who are getting help who were not able to go. I received uh, to the waiting upon God, and there were many who simply were not able. Circumstances beyond their control. I received a letter this morning from one of our most wonderful parishioners, Helen Rice. She wasn't able to go, but, but the Lord has revealed that when we're serving God, the best we know and waiting upon Him, He can give us just as much on the outer edges or in the other place. And that's what happened on Sunday morning at Scott Depot. God came in a wonderful way, had a great service. Pastor Terry had to go back and take care of the service. And Jesus came and gave him one of the most wonderful services we've had uh, in our times of being away upon God. But we're thankful for the splashings, the blessings that's coming in from those who were blessed. And so, you know, if the devil were to buffet you, just resist him. We're here in God's presence, and Jesus is leading and helping, and we're to rejoice with those who rejo- rejoice, and we're to weep with those who weep, and we're to, be in, we're to encourage one another. We're to exhort one another daily that our hearts will not be hard. I want to thank the Lord for Gary Miller, who's here from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, he's a part of a new fellowship forming there from a, a family that went out from us three or four years ago, maybe five, and uh, Gary's been with us in Scott Depot maybe a half a dozen times in the last year. And he didn't think he could be at the waiting on God, but his employer, without knowing that the waiting was going, assigned him to Cincinnati for that weekend, and he landed right there. And then he, ass- he assigned him to Indiana or Indianapolis, and that's why he's here tonight. So I'm so thankful the way Jesus is helping. There's a group up there from 15 to 20 people that are sincerely endeavoring to wait upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're very, very thankful for the several have been to see us, some more than once, Gary, half a dozen, the Dallies twice, I think. But uh, God is helping and blessing. Also to have uh, Pastor Steve, associate pastor here with us. We're uh, very close in the gospel. And... uh, Something happens when we're together that just doesn't seem to happen in any other way. It's just a joy to have him here. I, I try to call him every week, sometimes twice a week, because the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is so wonderful and so important. And it lifts me up. He's an unusual man, a close friend in the gospel, and uh, I thank the Lord for bringing us together. I asked my brother when... Um, our ministry began at Scott Depot. I said, you know, God's blessing and helping so much. I said, I've got to have an associate pastor. That's after Brother Helm said on the Sea of Galilee, your ministry will triple starting when you get back home. Well, you see it did. And one more year I needed help because there were maybe a hundred more than the year before. And so I said to my brother, I need some help. Where do you, is there anyone where you are that you know that loves God with all their heart. And he said, I just know of one man for sure that loves God with all of his heart. That was my brother Terry. Terry's a man of his word. So I knew I would listen. He said, his name is Stephen Reinhardt. And I said, sounds good to me. The name sounds good to me. I knew it was a German name, of course. But it sounds good to me. But I said, let's check with the man of God. I don't dare make a mistake. God sent me here by the witness of the Holy Spirit. And if Steve's ministry will work with mine, the Holy Spirit will say so. By God's grace, when I gave him the name, he said, I believe if you read the Bible and pray together, your ministries will blend. And we worked together for about 14 years before the Lord took him to Hickory, North Carolina. And there we have a sister church. And Scott Depot and Hickory are in love with each other as Scott Depot and Hickory and Parker City and all the rest where Jesus is leading. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know if I'm, I don't know just how I'm preaching tonight, uh, but, but I may be preaching from hunger, from your hunger. And God will honor that just as he honors uh, the prayer out of compassion. So I'm claiming the help of Jesus as I try to speak to you from Hebrews 2, uh, uh, from the second chapter of Hebrews. I spoke, I think, Sunday a week ago from Hebrews 1. Remember that the writer opened up his letter by pointing out how that Jesus was superior to the prophets. He was superior to the prophets in, the, in many ways, but especially, as he pointing out here, he's superior to the prophets because he reveals wholly what God is like. Being God in flesh, 
He is not giving us, Jesus does not give us a part of what God is like. He does not give us, he says, in many parts. That's the Greek, in many parts. The prophet spoke from facets. But Jesus reveals, because he's God in flesh, he reveals, has the total revelation. Therefore, he is, and his revelation, his message is superior to the prophets. Then he goes on, and he says that he is not only superior to the prophets, he is superior to the angels. For... To what angel did God ever say, you are a son? They are called the sons of God collectively, but never is an angel specifically described as a son or the son of God. But to Jesus it was said, you are my son from the Psalms, and today I've become your father. It was also said in the second Samuel, I will be his father and he will be my son. This means that was a messianic psalm. Or... Remember, he's saying to these people who thought so highly of the angels that the Bible says, let all of God's angels worship him, worship the Son. Of angels, it is said that they are created beings. But of Jesus, he is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. He was and is and forever will be. Therefore, he is superior to the angels. And he gives us that marvelous sum where it says that Jesus being eternal will roll up the universe and will take them on and discard them as a garment. One universe right after another. No angel ever had that privilege. And finally, he says in the first chapter, this is by way of introduction, he said, to what angel has God ever said, sit here while I make your enemies uh, your footstool? What, whatever, never. No, all angels are standing. They stand now. They stand as they hear in God's presence. But Jesus sits because his work was complete. He accomplished the work of salvation. He, he provided atonement for our sins. And now he sits. And as he sits in his high priestly ministry, he rules and he speaks. You see, God speaks to us now through the Son. Once he spoke directly and primarily through angels. But now he speaks through the Holy Spirit. He speaks to the Holy Spirit. The angels are now worshiping God. They also minister to us. See, he's working hard in this uh, letter, uh, this preaching assignment, and in this letter to get the church at Rome, a small house church, primarily of people who were uh, Hebrew children, that is, their background were Jewish, was Jewish, to get them to appreciate what Jesus is like because they need to know how mighty he is. And in that first chapter, he says that the universe is upheld, upheld by the word of his power. I'll just put this in right here. What good is that for you and for me? If you and I have a revelation of Jesus, we're going to have a different perspective as the troubles we're going through. If we have a revelation of Jesus, we're going to, we're going to depend upon him more than we ever have. If we have a revelation that he's upholding the world by the word of his power, then we're going to look to him altogether. And though we're covered up with problems and trials and distresses, and though we may be threatened like these people were threatened, we're going to look to Jesus because we know that he's going to bring us through. Now, this was something that they could accept. They were able to accept this. And then he says, after pointing that out, we're to pay very careful to this, to this salvation so great a salvation because if the, if the, in the old dispensation, if, the, if, they were repu uh, if they were punished with reference to their sins and they were taken in their disobedience, many were taken outside the camp and stoned. If that was so severe, if their disobedience was so severe, he's saying this salvation, which is so great, which was wrought by so great a price, is more, will be so, more severely judged than, than what was given in the Old Testament which means that you and I have been under the mercy of God. And His extended mercies only say to us that we're to give our hearts to Him. It's not that He's pleased with our living, but His blood so satisfied the heart of God that He's patient with us, that He's merciful with us. It so, it so extended His mercy to us that in His patience, God is saying to us, Come up, my son. Come up, my son. But it is not something that we can let drift by, and it is not something that we can let go for there is a day coming a judgment that will be very severe more severe than any severe thing that these people have faced in terms of the mosaic economy then he speaks to them and he says something very startling 
Well, he's now on the subject of angels again, and he said, it is not to angels that he has, he has subjected the world to come. Now, that's a startling thing. They didn't know that. This man had to have this by revelation. He was saying in the world to come, the world of reality, Jesus is complete charge. Now, that meant something to them because they knew that angels were assigned various territories over the earth. For instance, remember the prince of Persia? He resisted the prayers of Daniel. Well, he was the prince of Persia. He was over a territory. There's another prince mentioned in the name of Daniel, and I think it's Michael. It is said of Michael that he was the prince of the children of Israel. So angels had assignments, and angels had a territory. That is in the world now, that the world then and the world now. But in the world to come, they will not be in charge of any territory. Jesus will be in charge of it all. In the, in the world of the shadow and the types, angels have charge. But in the future world, he has complete control. Everything, everything is, in, is subjected to him. Now that's startling to these people because they have an idea that angels, because of their background, that angels are superior to Jesus. They've forgotten the revelation that was first given them. So this writer who is like a pastor is speaking to them to get them to have a superior view, an elevated view of Jesus. And while he's saying this, he says, but there is a place where someone is testified. He doesn't mention that it's the eighth psalm because he wants them to know that it's the word of God written by David, but really written by the Holy Spirit himself. So he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him. Now, what's so startling is that we're now finding out that this psalm is a messianic psalm and we really didn't know that it was. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What is a man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. Now, first of all, the psalm is the intention of God for us. For whenever he created us, he created us to have dominion over the things of the earth. But through sin, we lost dominion. Through sin, we lost the position that we were supposed to be in. So he goes on to make that comment. And putting everything under him, that is in man, God left nothing that is not subject to him yet, realistically, at pre and obviously at present, we do not see everything subject to him. And then he says, this is so wonderful, but we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Right here now, he's really driving home to these people who are in Rome. They were able to accept what he first wrote. But what he's saying now has been giving them problems for some time. And that is that Jesus was made lower than the angels. That he, that he came into the world of space and time and was made flesh. That's giving them a problem. But what the writer is going to help them to see that it was predicted in, in the writings of the Old Testament, which was all the Bible that they had from Genesis to Malachi, and that it, that it was altogether appropriate. It was altogether necessary. In fact, he says, in bringing many sons to glory, now look, what it, I'm not sure what it is, it became him, I think, in your King James, but here it said, it was fitting that God, and that's something they didn't realize. It was appropriate it was in the nature of God for whom and through whom everything exists that he should make the author of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect or equip him through suffering, make him adequate for the task, acquaint him for, for the task, uh, equip him for the task through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. And right here we have a, we have a different world view than these people were understanding. They, although they were Christian, there was a lot of Greek philosophy around. When viewing God, Greek philosophy says that God is detached. But Christian doctrine, Christian theology, Christian teaching, Christian revelation said God identifies with man. 
The reason the Greeks were so upset. See, one reason I'm bringing this out here for us is because we're influenced by the philosophies around us. We're influenced by what the presidents and candidates are saying. We're influenced by what the teachers are saying in college. We're influenced by all this. And yet much of it, if not most of it, is not really, is not the world of reality. It's another philosophy. For instance, we're in, we, we emphasize power. We may say that we don't, but we do. And we, we feel that power makes right. Power doesn't make right. And so it's hard to understand a man like Brother Helm who's so obviously weak. And yet, in the kingdom of God, weakness is the sign of validity, not, not strength. See, because it's in our weakness that Christ is made strong. Didn't he say that to Paul? He said, he said that I will make you strong through weakness. That was not the exact words, but in your weakness I am made strong. So as we're, why? That we might depend upon God for everything. And we go through these things, even, even things so severe that we may despair even of life. What? To tell us. So we won't depend upon ourselves. Because most of us are depending on ourselves just a little bit. And, and Brother Helm has lived a life left all to go with God where he isn't depending on himself for anything. He's depending upon Almighty God. Amen. And in doing that, the way of salvation is open. The way of sanctification is complete. See, it's a wonderful thing. Well, they're dealing with a philosophy here that says that the material is evil. And the background of this is the Gnostic and the Greek philosophy that material is evil. And so how could Jesus ever come? How could God ever get into a body if material is evil? Well, material is not evil. Evil is from another origin. And Jesus' body was pure. There was no sin in his body. And it's hard for these Greeks to understand it. And then they're influenced these Christian minds. It's hard for them to understand how a spirit could come into a body and it not be contaminated. The body wasn't contaminated. There was no original sin, you see. His, his, he was, was pure. And God made the world pure to start with. He intended for us to have a pure world. Material's not evil. And it's a pagan philosophy that intimates and suggests that material's evil. One thing you want to know for sure, when Jesus came into the body and when he died on Calvary and when he arose from the grave, he took a material body, a transformed body, but a material body and went to the right hand of the Father. And there forever and forever, heaven and earth meet. Heaven, and then he says we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. So you see, Christian theology is a, is a theology that sees the earth as a blessing. Though the earth is cursed. It is primarily intended to be whole. It is primarily intended to be pure. It is primarily created for our blessing and for our... ...had in order to become a priest, he had to become like us. In order to sympathize with us, he had to come like us. How could he ever do for us and give us the help we need if he doesn't know what we're going through? How could he be? You can't... You can't you can't really help another man or stand in his moccasins unless you can understand what's taking place in his own heart. God came down and walked just where we walk. He suffered just like we were. He was tempted in all points as we are. And, and then he is able to help us. And he's going to close this chapter with this. He, he gives us a, some scripture for this. And of course, again, they had Genesis to Malachi. This is mostly a teaching message, but it's exciting, isn't it? He gives, he gives them, uh, the, the, just as we proof text with the New Testament and the whole Bible, he gives them a, a text here that on, upon first reading is not understood. But look at it. Jesus is saying, he's quoting the 22nd Psalm, I will declare your name, he's saying to God, to my brothers, that's us, in the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. I like that real well. The singing Christ. The singing Christ. Did he sing? Oh, yes, he sang. After he gave John 17, he said, and they sung a hymn and went out. Oh, he sang. What do you think it was like standing by him? <laughs> Hear him, Jesus, sing. Why, is the most beautiful voice ever put into man. Why, I could hardly stand it. Why, when he, when he sang, he sang the most pure praise that's ever been sung on the face of the earth. I tell you, don't you think it didn't put fire in their feet? Don't you think they didn't want to hear him sing? 
Don't you think that John and Peter and the others didn't dim their voices a little bit so they could hear Christ sing? And what was he singing about? He was singing of what God was like. Brother, when he sang, he revealed the nature of God to, the, to his brothers. That's to us around about. Think of the singing Christ. I've never heard anybody preach on that. I'd like to sometime preach on the singing Christ. Now, I want you to know that's what he was doing here tonight when Robert Allen was singing. That's what he was doing when, when Roger was singing. What you heard was the living Christ within. And what you heard because it's under the anointing was the singing Christ. He's still singing. So as God led in the waiting on all these songs, it was the singing Christ standing in the presence of the congregation. He was standing with his brothers. He's identified with us. He's taken his sin upon, upon himself in order that we might be purged of sin. He's become an atonement for us. And he stands in the presence of the congregation. That's why music's so important. It can be a tool of the devil, but it is really supposed to be a tool for God. Stir the emotions, yes. Speak of things so deep that can hardly be uttered, yes. Because music does that, even as poetry does. But oh my, God wants to anoint music so that it will speak to the heart of man and it will reveal what God is like. Oh, I think of uh, Jack and Arlene singing here the day. God is still on the throne. Who was doing that? Jesus was. That was Jesus singing. What was he telling us? He never will forsake of his own. It was Christ. His promise is true. That's good to know. Because the devil makes some promises, but they're not true. His is. He may or may not deliver. He'll not forget you. That's good to know. God is still on the throne. See, that's the singing Christ. Song after song after song after song after song after song. God gave us at the waiting upon God. Even he has it here on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. And it's the living Christ singing within because he guides. He's, that's, why the, what, that's why it's so important that he lead. Because if he's leading, then in that song, he's revealing what God's like. See how great that is? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So he identifies. Greek said God's detached. He says he's not interested in us ants. But he, Jesus says God is interested in us. He created us and he created us and he wants to restore the dominion. And so Jesus has come to restore that dominion unto us. Then he uses another psalm from Isaiah 8 and 17. I will put my trust in him. I really like it. And it takes a little study to understand what is he saying. I will put my trust in him. I think the context here is a great scholar by Dodd, C.H. Dodd pointed out to us. Context is so important here. How did Psalms 22 open up? It opened up with, Oh God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's how Psalms 22... 22, 20, Psalms 22 is the crucifixion psalm. Yes. Back in this day, they knew immediately where this psalm came from. Oh, that's the crucifixion psalm. Christ gave those words on the cross. But after that work was accomplished, he began singing. But you want to see it's in the context of darkness. It's in the context of a time when it looked like God had failed. See, what is he saying to those people in Rome? He's saying this, it may be dark, but God has not failed. There was a time when Jesus was on the cross when he actually uttered and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it wasn't because God had failed. He had taken his sin upon us and the back of God was turned for what must seem like an eternity in order that you and I might be delivered from this awful plague. You see? See how wonderful that is? And yet in a little while, God revealed himself. Now, that's the association of I will put my trust in him in Isaiah 8, 17. Isaiah has delivered the word of God. It was rejected both by the king and by the Israelites. And in this time of darkness, Isaiah was seen folding up the scroll because the word of God was no more for the people of that day. And he put the scroll in the hands of his disciples because it was going to be put there so you and I could open the great scroll of Isaiah one of these days and see that what Isaiah spoke was true. For instance, there was a light for the Gentiles coming. You see, God gave him the hope. God, they rejected the message of salvation. He rolled the old scroll up. He stamped it shut. He sealed it. He put it in the hands of his disciples. And then as he was walking off, this is what Isaiah said. 
I, in the time of darkness and rejection, I will put my trust in Him. I will put my trust in Him. I will put my trust in Him. Now, Christ, these are messianic words. He's saying in the time of darkness, Christ was saying, I will put my trust in Him. Was it dark for Christ? It was utterly dark. Was it dark for Jesus? He was totally rejected. He was even forsaken by His own. They all forsook Him and fled. It was dark. Yet Christ was heard saying earlier through, the, through Isaiah and then finally openly, I will put my trust in Him. See, now what's that saying to the people in Rome? Dark? Yes. Threatening? Yes. But there's light ahead, my folks. There's light. There's encouragement for us. We are to say, my, we, we may be saying, Oh, Lord, it seems like you've forsaken me. But we're to know that we're not forsaken by Christ and that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. And in the darkest hour, our faith should be so inspired that those around us will hear us say, I will put my trust in Him. I will put my trust in Him. That's what Job said. Job said, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Oh, what great faith, how great it is. You see, Isaiah was in a dark spot. The Psalms 22 opens with darkness. But in the middle of it is faith in God and a recognition that this confidence must not be lost. While God's working out some things through darkness, we're not to doubt Him. We're to put our trust in Him. And then Isaiah says of his own children, but it really is words that Christ was speaking, Here am I and the children God has given me. Here I am. Notice it changed from brothers to children. I thought that was something in progression. And the only place where we're called the children of Christ, as far as I know, it's a unique and precious passage. Right here it says we're the children of Jesus. See, most of the time we're referred to as his brothers. He's our elder brother. But right here we're his children. I like it, don't you? The children. He said, here am I in this dark spot and the children thou hast given me. Oh, how great. Now, what is this? Identity. 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 Not old Zeus on Mount Olympus, detached in his own fleshly ways. <laughs> Not Pluto and Mercury and all the rest. No, no, no. This is the living God, and this living God loves you, and he loves me, and he identifies. He says, here I am. I'm in the midst of the brothers, and I'm telling them what you're like. I'm demonstrating what you're like. Furthermore, I'm singing your praises. I'm revealing through song what you're like. That's great, isn't it? Then he says, and here I am. Here are these children you've given me. In Isaiah, in the 53rd chapter, we're referred to by implication as his children because it says we're his offspring. It's a great concept. Thus we can sing, as Isaiah said later, he is a, a, an everlasting father. He is a mighty God. He is the prince of peace. He is, and don't put a comma here, it's not wonderful, and then counselor. No, it's wonderful counselor. He is the wonderful counselor, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. I was thanking him this morning in prayer that he, the government's on his shoulders, not mine. What he wants us to do is to recognize that and leave it all to him. Let him real. That's why I came to pray. Why? The government's on his shoulders. Holy Spirit operated, come and pray. The government's on his shoulders. So I came. The, the, Lord, the government's on his shoulders. That's why we had a waiting upon God. The government's on his shoulders. That's why we're going to Israel. It's this government. What government? He, right at the right hand of the Father where he's speaking, where he's reigning for us, where he's praying for us, where he's ordering all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, why don't we see more of this reality? It's what, it's what we see by faith and what we know by the word of God. The real world is governed by Christ. Not all things are subject to Him. He's sitting there while the enemies are being put under His feet as His footstool. But while He's reigning, we are to be reigning with Him. And the reason for it and what makes Him so superior, and I come to the close of this teaching message, is found in the latter part of the second chapter. Look at it. It's beautiful. Since the children, that's us, have flesh and blood, He too shared in their human humanity. Think of how superior that was to Aaron and sons. Think of it. Aaron was a human being, but he wasn't tempted in all points as we are, but Jesus was. 
Isn't it great that not one of you have an experience here today, but what Jesus hasn't felt that to a greater degree? See, the essence of sin, he's felt the pulling, the temptation, he's felt it to a greater degree. And I can't explain that altogether. I just know the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are. So we have a sympathizing Jesus. Brother, let me tell you something. No wonder. See, the theme of this book is draw near. The theme of this book is not in your trials and your temptations draw away. The theme is when you're, on, when you're in blackness and when you're in darkness, say with Christ, I will put my trust in him. Say with, hear the voice of Jesus when he says, come unto me. And the writer to the Hebrews, and it's Christ himself speaking, says, let us draw near, seeing we have this great high priest. Well, let's finish with this because there are two important things here that we'll mention in closing. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. The first significant sign of Barbara's salvation was that she lost her fear of death. When she was saved five years after we were married, you remember how it came to pass? God's servant told me she would be saved. And I said, what am I going to do? I'm married to a woman who will not go with me to preach the gospel. She will not be a pastor. She said, she'll never go with me. And he looked at me. And he said, well, she maybe, he said, you may have to wait a long time. God said, pray. I said, what does that mean? He said, you may have to wait a long time, son. God said, pray. It wasn't going to be so long. So he bowed his head. He said, Jesus, how long is it going to be? The Lord told him in five weeks. He said, now don't you tell her. He said, if Jesus is in this, why, you just love her and pray. You don't have to say this because you sometimes give a revelation and defeat the whole thing. And he went not to do that. So he said, you just love her and pray. And I walked in. On the third day of the fifth week, she had her Bible open. She said, I've given my heart to Jesus today. <laughs> and that night, she says, and I have no fear of death. And just a week before, she had wake, awakened crying in the night because our neighbor had died of a heart attack. And she had that burden. And she had the burden of death. She was afraid she would die in her sins. But whenever God saved her, it was gone. When Jesus died for us, he took the fear of death away from us because through death, he transformed it. Now, here's where death defeats death. He transformed us. And so, he's saying to these in Hebrews, you may face martyrdom. You may die for your faith. It's possible. But whatever, your death will not be a judgment. It will be a blessing. And furthermore, God will be in charge of it. Brother and Sister Morgan said to me one time, I was so concerned about facing certain religious people who had me under great trial, great testing. And they said to me, oh, Oliver, be encouraged. It says here in the book of Revelation that the, the dragon didn't come out of the pit until the witnesses had finished their testimony. Oh, I said, praise the Lord, I don't think I'm finished yet. They, they're not going to kill me yet. And they didn't. They almost did, but they didn't. I made it. I'm 50 years old. The heart attack came at 34 and heart trouble thereafter, but I'm feeling better tonight, and I did at 34. At 50 years of age, feeling better tonight, and they didn't think I'd live very many years. Isn't it wonderful? See, Jesus has strengthened me. Oh, that word sucker is a great thing in the, in the New Testament. So, by, so he's eliminated our fear of death, and I saw it in Barbara. By the way, the next day she said, and when are you going to pastor? I'm ready to go. Talk about Transformation. Well, she had said, you may be called to be a pastor, but I'm not called to be a pastor's wife. And if you go, you'll go by yourself. Well, I want you to know she was ready before I was. She was over at Anderson College in the seminary. She was ready to go. And lo and behold, she was getting word from God that I wasn't able to hear. That's humbling. It's humbling. Because on August 31st, 1966, we went up to Wilshire where he was preaching. I was leading the singing for that meeting too. And we went up there, and I said, Brother Helm, I said, you think God wants me to get a little church uh, while I'm going to seminary? He thought that'd be a good idea. But uh, whenever he prayed, he said, you won't be going to school this fall. And Barbara says, that's what Jesus has been telling me. She had been saved the weeks. I've been claiming salvation since six years of age. Say, get ready to be humble, no matter who you are. Get ready for God to speak to some lowly one that maybe not have been on the road as far as he... I wouldn't... You know, I thought about uh, Larry Joe, and he's new in Christ, but I thought if we'll listen real carefully, we may hear something we've never heard before. 
Because from where he came from and his perspective and the way God wants to teach him, we've got something to learn from Larry Joel. See, this is true for all persons, but this is, this is a new convert. Oh, may he be encouraged. May he be strengthened in his faith, in his testings and in his trials. May he be encouraged in Christ's name. This is written for our encouragement. For surely, now here, notice this. After he said, we've been freed from death. And he said, we've been, uh, the power of death has been, we've been delivered from it. And then he said, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now listen to this. Talk about a punchline. For surely it is not angels he helps. Angels had fallen. Why didn't he die for them? Well, he didn't. And he never will. But he died for us. He did, not, he did not come to help angels, but Abraham's descendants. That's us, meaning faith, the Hebrews, and us. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Now, here's the, here's the punchline. It's a double punch. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. They were stumbling over his humanity because of the Greek philosophy, and they were stumbling over his suffering. You couldn't hardly impress one Greek in the country with a suffering God. For to them, God was detached. But if God is detached, then he cannot be a high priest for us because a high priest must be one of us. He must be human. He must have a gift. And he must make reconciliation between God and man. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect man. And because of his perfection and coming into humanity, then his sacrifice was accepted once for all. And he now lives to make intercession for us. And he now lives to speak to us about the government being upon his shoulders. And whether we're in darkness or not, we can say with Isaiah and we can say with Christ, I will put my trust in him. Oh, isn't it wonderful in the middle of the night to wake up sometime, I don't know what else to say, to say, I love you, Jesus. I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you more than my sweetheart. I love you more than my children. I love you more than my church. I love you, Jesus, more than any earthly thing or any earthly interest. I love thee, Jesus. I love thee. I know I don't love thee perfect, but Lord, you're perfecting me. I love you, Jesus. I say it in the middle of the night. I've said it for years. I've said it for weeks. I've said it for months. I've cried in the middle. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Sometimes that's all I can say. I just, I love you, Jesus. I lo Jesus, I love you. Oh, Christ, thou art worthy. Thou art beautiful. Thou art wonderful. And Jesus, you died for me. I love you because you first loved me. And Lord, you know exactly how I feel. And you're going to help me. That's what he said when he came in vision. I will show you the way through. I know what you've been through. Think of it. I come as your good shepherd to show you the way through. I will lead you and guide you. That's what he was saying when he stood by my side after 40 years when I first saw Christ. You saw Christ and was transformed as a little girl. I did not see him until 1984, August the 31st, 18 years after the revelation came that we were to go into the ministry. Isn't it wonderful? It says, I know what you've been through. I come as your good shepherd to show you the way through. I will lead you and I will guide you with Isaiah and with Christ who sings and testifies. We say together tonight, we will put our trust in Him. We are not only His brothers, we are His children. And the government is upon His shoulders. And He ever lives praying for us. Later on, we hear Him say as I preach down at the waiting upon God, He is saying, we have throne rights, therefore we are in our bowling. We're children. Therefore we're in our Father's room. And we are there to obtain mercy. That's when we're in trouble as Christians. And we're to find grace for help in time of need. That's right now. And whenever do you and I not have great need? Or need. And sometimes great need. And so the Lord has spoken to us in the second chapter of Hebrews. As he did in the first. As he does in the seventh. 
as he does in the eighth, as he did in the fourth. For in the fourth, the speaking Christ is saying, Oh, that men would hear my voice today and not harden their hearts. That was the message the other night. Oh, that men would hear my voice today. He's praying for us, but he's speaking to us. Not primarily through the prophets, that is, for his whole revelation. Not, not primarily through the angels. But He is speaking. The living Christ through the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. And He says, oh, here, what I want. I want you to do this today. I want you to read. I want you to pray. I want you to witness. I want you to obey. I want you to wait on me. I have an assignment over here. There's somebody in need over here. I don't want you to do this. The government's upon His shoulders. Oh, what a joy it is to come into this new economy and to be children of Christ and to follow Him wherever He goes. He is leading and by God's grace, we must follow. And if we follow, He will help us. We don't have to figure. we all tied up with the philosophies. We just have to follow. And as we follow, He puts something into it that's way beyond ourselves, a strength that's way beyond ourselves. How can you explain the transformation in most every life in this place? See, it's the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And put a love in our hearts when we actually were opposed to Him. For the carnal nature is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And cause this desire to spring out of our hearts to walk with Him and to say no to this lower nature, to say no to this carnal nature, and then ask Him to take it clear out of us so that as He was in this life, so will we be also. She said, Brother Helm is so pure. God wants us just that pure. She's right. That's why the glory came down. But he wants you and I just that pure. Say, he's well nigh able to do it. He's well nigh able to do it. That's the whole reason for the waiting upon God. It's the whole reason for our gathering is that we might come into sonship and the mighty power of God will accomplish it if we will follow on. If there's sin, then we repent. But as we walk in the light, He is faithful and just, or that He is, gives us fellowship one with another, and He cleanses us from all sin, all the sin principle. Isn't that great? Oh, Jesus, thank You for helping tonight. It touches my heart. Oh, Father, here we've just really had a teaching message instead of a preaching message, but oh, I've been happy with it, Lord. I thank You that in two, over two years ago, I said to Your servant in Florida, now, sir, I finished the book of Romans for two and a half years. You gave me that assignment through the Holy Spirit. What book does God want me to go to now? I think Vera was there and Helen Klein and my wife. He said, after he prayed a little bit, he said, well, how about Hebrews? And I knew it was one of the most difficult books. Yet, Lord, you're our teacher. And you want us to get past the elementary things and to get our eyes upon what Jesus is doing now. The high priestly ministry of Christ the place from which he governs all things that are real while the world of the shadow and the copy falls away. Sanctify us and let us join thee in the congregation. Join with the singing Christ and reveal the nature of Almighty God for it is in him and him alone that we have hope and confidence. In Jesus' name, amen.